Riddle me this. What is one thing that you cannot stop looking for, yet you can only find it when you're not trying to? Any guesses? What's that? Hope? Uh, maybe. Um, I guess we probably shouldn't try to play guess what the teacher's thinking because um, there may be more than one right answer to this. <laughs> the answer that I have in mind is happiness. You have to pursue happiness. You can't not pursue trying to be happy. Uh, philosophers, uh, religious teachers throughout the ages in almost every culture, every civilization, in almost every faith tradition have made the claim that you have to pursue happiness. Uh, from secular thinkers, humanist thinkers, religious thinkers, spiritual thinkers, um, almost a, it, this is one of the very few things that is almost universally agreed upon. People have to pursue happiness. But the irony of pursuing happiness is that it can only be found, lasting happiness that is, the kind of happiness that your heart really craves, that kind of happiness can only be found when you're pursuing something greater than happiness. Do you want to find joy? Do you want to be able to live your life with a settled happiness? Not an emotional high here and there, but a settled happiness that can't be rattled by any circumstance? If you do, then let's pray. Let's turn to God's word. Let's see what God has to say about this. Father, we bow in your presence. We gather in your name and for your glory. You are the one we want. I believe and I pray that you would show us, God, that you are happy. <laughs> you are the source of happiness. You are the source of life and joy that our souls were designed for. And so, God, I pray Open up your word to exalt your name, that we would see you for who you are, we would follow after you with everything we are, and that through all of this, God, you would shape us into your image increasingly so that this city would know that you are good, that we would experience the joy we long for, and you would receive the glory you deserve. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be continuing through our series, Better Hope. have been going through a series on 1 Peter. So if you have your Bibles, you can feel free to open up to 1 Peter. Um, otherwise, the, verse, uh, the verses will be on the screen. And I am going to be starting in verse 8. So this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, attaining the outcome of your faith, salvation of your souls. There's something that's, that's comforting to me about this passage. Have you ever read through the Bible or considered ugh, what, what you feel like you should be doing to follow Jesus? And, and just, have you ever considered those things, read through the Bible, thought about the things that you should be doing or should be believing, and wondered, or thought, man, if I could have seen Jesus, I would believe what they say. Right? Like, if I could have followed Jesus in person and watched him heal the sick, give sight to the blind, raise the dead, if I could have seen him rise from the dead, then of course I would believe these things. Peter was one of those people who saw that. And he seems to know, I think, that this may be something that people who didn't experience what he experienced, that is, following Christ physically, he seems to know that believing without seeing is a challenge. It was a challenge then, it's a challenge now. Church historians will tell you that the early Christians were actually considered atheists. They were considered atheists because in that culture, the way that the, that the, the pagan world worshipped their gods was through um, idols. So every god, and there was gods for just about everything, every god would have a temple, or sometimes multiple gods would share a temple. 
But then within that temple, there would be statues, there would be idols that, the, that people would come and offer their sacrifices to to worship their God. So the, the framework that people had in considering pursuing a God was you went to a temple, which was considered where that God lived, and then you would offer something to a statue, which was considered to be where that God would reside. So then these Christians come along and be built, building off of their Jewish foundation, they don't sacrifice to any statues. And because they, were, they weren't, uh, very, very soon, they weren't welcomed within the synagogues, they didn't have a temple to worship at either. So they, didn't, they weren't able to go to a temple. They didn't sacrifice the statues. These people were weird. <laughs> they, they, they worshiped in a way nobody else did. With a box that did not exist in their culture. They lived with values that nobody else had. They did some crazy things. The outside world didn't know what to do with them. So in fact, when you read through Acts, the, the book of Acts, you'll see in Acts chapter 11 that it was the outside world that named the church Christians. The outside world looked at this group of people who said that they were following this dead man who they claimed was alive, and they didn't know what to do with these people, so they gave them a new name. They called them Christians, little Christs, because the, the world didn't have a box for them. They lived with such, with such radically different values and worshipped in such radically different ways. They made no sense to the world around them. And yet, Peter says that they were rejoicing with joy that was inexpressible and filled with glory. What did they have? I don't know how you feel, but when I see people who are happier than me, I almost automatically assume that they have something I don't, right? Like, they have the kids that behave in the way I wish my kids would. They make the money that I would like to make. They live in the place that I would like to live. Like, they have these things going for them, and that's what's making them happy. I don't have their stuff. I don't have their circumstances, so I can't possibly be as happy as them. How could you expect me to? Well, so let's take a look then at what was going on with the church that first Peter, that Peter is writing to in this book. So maybe, maybe this was just a, a group of shiny, happy people holding hands. Maybe it was just their temperament. Maybe this is just a bunch of little Richard Simmons that were just like these super balls of positive energy that were going to like make everybody happy around them. Maybe that's what Peter has in mind. I don't think so. <laughs> I think that kind of thing just winds up being annoying to most people over time. So it probably wasn't their temperament. Maybe, maybe it was their success then. Maybe they were so successful that they were happy. Maybe they trusted God and God gave them everything they ever wanted. Maybe they prayed in the right way and so they got more money. Maybe they gave enough money and so they got more promotions. Maybe it was that. But I don't think so. This letter was written to people on the margins of society. In chapter 2, Peter is going to write to how we can navigate different um, relationships within the world. And one of those relationships, Peter says, is servants be subject to your masters. He's writing to slaves, indentured servants at best. And he says, servants be subject to your masters. Now, we'll talk more in detail about what all this may mean later on. But for now, one of the things that I think we can pull out of this just to, to advance this point is... Um, this wasn't a common, this was not an uncommon instruction. You, you see even the Apostle Paul writes something similar in the book of Colossians. But in the book of Colossians, when Paul says, servants be subject to your masters, he also says, masters, treat your servants with respect. Peter has no such comp complimentary um, instruction. So one of the things you can draw from this is that the churches that Peter is writing to, they're not a cross-section of socioeconomic diversity. They're poor. This is poor people, servants, not masters, living on the margins of society. So it's not their success that's making them happy. Well, maybe they just had it easy then. Maybe because they aren't at the top, no one's trying to pull them down. <laughs> so maybe things are just easy for them. But if that were the case, then Peter wouldn't tell them that God's power is guarding them in the middle of their trials. 
Over and over and over again throughout this letter, Peter talks about how they can navigate suffering with the power of God. So if things were just easy for them, they, uh, then Peter wouldn't have to tell them that it's going to be God's power that guards them in suffering. So that can't be where their happiness is coming from. So where is it coming from? Where do you think happiness comes from? Where would you like happiness to come from? If you're sitting in here today, which you are, uh, as well as a couple of you are standing, but if you're with me, are you as happy as you'd like to be? I don't mean do you have all the things in your life that you'd like to have. I just mean like your general disposition in life. Do you, do you live with the settled happiness that you'd like to have? Do you live with a contentment that just makes you a pleasant, cheerful person that people like to be around? Would you like that? Thankfully, Peter tells us what was making these churches so happy. He says it right here in verse 8. He uses a poetic technique that's called synonymous parallelism. What he does is he puts these two ideas synonymously parallel to each other, where he starts off uh, these two different ideas. He says that, though you have not seen him, you love him. And then the parallel idea starts the same way. Though you do not see him now, you are filled with an, you, you, you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So the concepts start the same, though you do not see him and though you do not see him now. The ideas that are parallel there are, though you do not see him, you love him and because you love him then, you are filled. You rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Loving a God you cannot see, will produce a joy you cannot contain. That's what Peter's getting at. Loving a God you cannot see will produce a joy you cannot contain. Now, the joy that these churches had was obvious. It was overflowing. The contentment, the joy, the happiness, the hope that these churches lived with was so obvious to the world around them, that in chapter 3, Peter has to tell them, hey, when people ask you about your hope, be ready to give them an answer. There was something about their contentment, about their happiness, about their joy that was so starkly different from the world around them, that was so obviously overflowing out of them, that Peter had to prepare them to answer people who were asking them, where's your hope? Where's your joy? Why do you have this thing that I don't? Which is so convicting to me. Because I can't remember the last time anybody asked me that question. You? (laughs) But you love God. I mean, you're here, right? So you want to love God or you want to consider what it may mean to love God So why aren't we experiencing this? What did they catch about this that we still may be missing? Everything we do is driven by an unstoppable desire in our hearts to make ourselves happy. Everything we do pushes toward that end. But we don't want to admit this for some reason. Sounds selfish, right? Like it sounds, it, maybe it sounds normal to say, I'd like to live a happy life. That may sound normal, but when you, when you put it on the ground, we don't really want to start stepping in the directions that would follow that conclusion because it's going to sound selfish. Play this out with me. Packers play at 320 today. Somebody asks you if you want to go watch the Packers with them today, but you don't. How are you going to respond? You're going to say something, like you're going to give them a reason for why you can't watch the game at their place, right? You're going to say, well, I'm busy, I've had a long weekend, blah, 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 blah. But really what you mean is, I'm not going to go watch the game at your house with you because I would be happier watching the game by myself in my basement. 
it would make me happier to be alone than to be with you. That's what you mean. <laughs> that's why you do it. And that sounds terrible, doesn't it? But underneath it all, is that not why we say yes to the things we say yes to? Unless, unless uh, you may say yes, even though you don't want to, but the reason that you would say yes to go and watch the game at somebody's house when you do not want to is because you would rather deal with being unhappy watching the game with somebody else than the guilt that you would feel by telling them no. Instinctively, we want to be happy. Our hearts are on an unrestrained mission for happiness. Randy Alcorn says um, in his book, that, uh, his book on happiness, that's he's cleverly titled this book, he called it Happiness. Um, in his book, Happiness on Happiness, he says that telling people to try to not pursue their happiness is like telling people to try to not breathe. Just can't do it. Can't do it. You're going to be instinctively driven to try to be happy. You need it. Almost as much as you need to breathe. So the question in my mind then becomes why? Why do lawmakers fight over what's going to make things better for society? Like, why do politicians year after year stand up and, and present something that's going to make America utopia? Right? Why? Why are we driven for that? Why do artists create pieces that, that, that make you want to leave this world and enter into another one? A happy world. Why, when you watch a movie or read a book that doesn't end with a happy ending, why do you just kind of feel, ugh, after watching a movie like that? Because God is happy. God's happy. We serve, we follow, we were created in the image of a God who is fundamentally thoroughly, consistently, un unshakably happy. He has existed in perfect community throughout eternity. Father, Son, and Spirit. God has been love. He is love. God is happy. He didn't create the universe in order to make himself happy. He created everything, including you, because he already is happy. God didn't create you so that he could have someone to love. He already had perfect love within himself, within the triune, the triune community that is God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So he didn't make you in order so that he could have someone to love. He made you because he is love. God is happy. And if you don't believe that, then you are going to pursue happiness in something other than him. You're going to pursue happiness. You can't stop. You can't stop your heart from trying to be happy. And if you don't believe God's happy, you're going to try to be happy in something else. And if you don't believe that God's happy, then you may not believe that God wants you to be happy. And if you don't believe that God's happy, you're going to pursue happiness and all these other things that are just going to leave you disillusioned because they can't bear the weight that your soul was designed for. And if you don't believe that God wants you to be happy, then as soon as you start to experience a feeling, a moment, a circumstance that would make you feel an ounce of joy, your guilt is going to extinguish that flame as quickly as possible. Because instinctively, you believe that God doesn't want you to be happy. And that's just not true. God is happy. He designed us to be perfectly happy in him. In him. Do you believe that God is happy? Do you believe that God wants you to be happy? When we don't, we pursue happiness outside of him in things that leave us disillusioned and discontent. And so what is God supposed to do with us? What's God supposed to do with this? What is, what is God supposed to do when the people he created believe something fundamentally wrong about him? What's he supposed to do with us? What would you do? 
What would you do if you found out that some of your best friends, when they really wanted to have a good time, they intentionally left you out? Because they were convinced that just your presence in their party would be a total buzzkill to their night. What would you do with that group of people? So what should God do for us? How do you think this all-powerful, all-loving, just, holy God would respond to a creation that owes him their very breath, yet we treat him this way? Because we believe, we believe something fundamentally different about God, something fundamentally wrong about God, than who he's clearly revealed himself to be in the scriptures. What should God do with us? What would make God happy here? What makes God happy in this equation? When you turn to the scriptures, you'll see it'll take your breath away. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he took up our pain. He took our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we're healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Skipping down to verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. And cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, this is what has made God happy. He took on our unhappiness. This is what has got this is what has brought the heart of God pleasure. See, in verse 10 here, it says that it was the Lord's will to crush him. Speaking of Jesus, this is one of the famous prophecies about Christ. Speaking of Jesus, it says that it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Now, this same phrase, the Lord's will, in many different places in the Bible, including Psalm 115 and 135, if you check those, those passages out, what you'll see is there's verses in there that's, that talks about God's pleasure, that God does whatever pleases him. This phrase that we translate, it was the Lord's will, could be translated just as accurately to say it was the Lord's delight. It was God's pleasure. Comes from the same word. And you can trans- translators uh, choose what they're gonna, how they're going to translate that depending on the context. So you could accurately say that it made God happy to crush him. Cause him to suffer. Why? Not because he's masochistic. Not because he's just mean. But because through crushing Christ... Jesus took our pain. Jesus took our suffering. Jesus is our healing. Jesus is our happiness. Our wandering has been fully healed by him. Jesus died in the cross in our place. In that, in that, Jesus got God's justice. We got God's mercy. Jesus took on God's wrath we get showered with God's love. God was able to fully uphold his holiness, his righteousness, and his love and mercy by Jesus dying on the cross in our place. And so now God, God can be fully who he is. See, it makes God happy to make us happy in him. And now that Jesus has paid for our sin, he's reconciled our relationship to God, there is nothing that stands in the way from God delighting in you. If you are in Christ, if you have received Jesus as your Savior, God delights in you. And it brings his heart joy when you find joy in him. You can't help but pursue happiness and you will find no greater happiness than in the God who loves you enough to die for you and rescue you. This gives God delight when his children delight in him. 
Your guilt has been cleared. Your shame has been crucified. You are free. You're free to pursue unending happiness in God. Sam Storms asked this question in his book, The Singing God. He asks, what is the limit of pleasure you can seek in God? How much is too much? How far is too far? And the answer Storms gives is none. God places no limits on how far you can pursue happiness and pleasure in him. It's breathtaking. This is the gospel. And this gospel, our salvation, has left the cosmic audience on the edge of their seats. Verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, yours, church, yours, this grace is yours. Because what Jesus has done for you is yours. They searched and they inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they, were, that they were not serving themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Check this out. These are things into which angels long to look. Angels. The supernatural army of God who, who worship God around his throne unhindered. They long to understand what you experience through the gospel. And it's yours because of the grace of God. Do you want to live with a settled happiness? Do you want to be the kind of person who is described as loving God so thoroughly that you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory? Then look to Christ. Look at the cross. Angels want to understand the gospel. The great prophets of old searched intently into the gospel, and we get to live out the gospel. We get to embrace the gospel. We get to be sustained by the gospel. We get to share the gospel. And through that proclamation, we get to watch the Spirit of God bring dead souls to life. Church, God wants you to be eternally happy. Again, Elkhorn says in his book that God is so, he's so crazy to make you happy that he will raise you from the dead, he'll create a new universe, and he'll let you live with him forever in heaven. God loves you. The cross proves it forever. So practically then, practically, what can we do to find our happiness in God, to seek happiness in God? In the first 12 verses of 1 Peter, I counted at least six. There may be more. I don't think there's less than six. Um, so I'm going to just give you this list. You're probably not going to remember all of them. So as I go through this, I'd encourage you to uh, just hang on to maybe two that you think are going to be helpful for you this next week to be able to, to continue to point your heart toward Christ. Number one, live like an exile. First Peter 1 Peter 1.1 said that we are exiles here. Live like an exile. Don't, don't throw all of your eggs into this basket. It's going to hell in a handbasket, <laughs> right? Don't, don't invest your forever in something that isn't going to last. Send it ahead of you. Invest in forever. Live for eternity. Seek God that way. God has a better home for you in heaven. It's an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Seek heaven, not this place. Number two, trust God in trials. Just because things aren't going exactly the way that you want right now does not mean that God does not have you exactly where he wants you right now so that he can produce in you a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. God has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Just because you're going through a hard time does not mean that God is not there. Trust God in trials. Third, obey God. We are saved by God to obey God because God wants you to be happy. His laws, his commands weren't designed to suck the joy out of your life, but to bring joy into your life. I love the way that John Piper thinks about this. 
in Piper's book, The Pleasures of God, he says that the commands of God are only as hard to obey as the promises of God are hard to believe. Love that phrase. The commands of God are only as hard to obey as the promises of God are hard to believe. God has an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Believe that God loves you. Number four, live on mission. Verse one says that we're exiles. And as we read through the rest of the letter, what we'll find out is that we're not supposed to just bide our time here in this place waiting for Jesus to come back. But we're supposed to live on mission. We are here for those who aren't here yet. This isn't just about us. This is about God demonstrating his glory in every corner of this planet, starting in your backyard. We are here for those who aren't here yet. We need to live like we're on mission. Uh, the, The social media team has been working really hard to get you some tools that can help you live on mission, even online been doing different things to to help people uh, prepare for the upcoming Sunday, to reflect on the past Sunday, created a video that we can can share and post online that can let people know about what God's doing here in this church. It's just one way. That's just one way. But live on mission. If you want to find your happiness in God, then then don't, don't hide from the world that God's trying to save. Seek what God's doing in the midst of a world that he's redeeming with his blood. Fifth, serve others. Nothing will kill your joy faster than self-focus. This is what I meant in the beginning. When your aim is to make yourself happy, you won't find happiness. Serve others. So that's what the prophets did, right? That it was revealed to them that they weren't serving themselves, but us. The gospel was then preached to us. So we find our joy, we find our happiness, not in serving ourselves, but in looking to serve other people. And think about this. Think about this. If you want to be happy in God, what needs to change in your life right now, right this moment? What needs to change in order for you to seek God and serve others? What needs to change for you to do that? Nothing, right? And so if God can give us happiness in seeking him and serving others, you can be happy right where you're at in your life right now. Seek God, serve others, and seek God, and in doing that, God will produce a joy in your heart that cannot be contained. So serve Serve the students you teach. Serve the kids you stay at home with. Serve the people above you and below you. Serve the people on your news feed. Serve all the people that God has placed around you. Serve them without expectation. Let God do the work. Enjoy God. Enjoy God. Enjoy what God is doing in people's lives and he'll produce a joy in your heart that cannot be contained or explained. Number six. goes along with the last one. Intentionally seek God so that the prophets of old searched intently. What do you search intently into? Stocks, sports, fashion. Search for God intently. Search the scriptures intently, and God will produce a joy in your heart as you seek to find Christ on every page of the Bible. It's not that any of those other things that we can seek are bad, but when we seek God intently, when we seek to find him in every area of our lives, then God will produce happiness in us that nothing can take away. Why? Because God's happy. And he wants you to be happy in him. Shame, misery, that's the devil's stuff. (laughs) Jesus died to save you to clear your guilt, to crucify your shame, and to give you joy that cannot be contained. Let me pray. God, let us, God, let us desire you enough. Let us desire you enough that we would want this enough 
that we would say no to lesser pleasures, that we would turn from sin that would steal joy. God, let us experience a taste of your happiness, that we would see how much better it is to be happy in you than in anything else in this world. And God, stir up a desire in our hearts, light a fire in our hearts, God. Let that fire turn into a flame that would burn with white hot passion to be made happy in the glory of God and for the good of all people. God, turn our hearts to praise you now. Holy Spirit of God, let us experience your joy even now. Pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.